traveling to BDBD, the largest refugee settlement in Uganda, is an experience worth sharing. As early at 7.30, we're on road cruising through the smooth tarmac from Arua town, known to many as the West Nile Regional Commercial Capital and host of West Nile Web Head Office. Like many across the world, we had heard the stories of the refugees from South Sudan, and this time, we wanted to hear for ourselves on ground. Braving the early rush, our dust of traffic from Koboko, ushers one to Yumbe Town. Hither drew a little known dusty town, old rugged buildings and largely devoid of major activity. Something which has since changed with the coming of refugees in 2016. Yumbe, despite the slow pace of infrastructural growth, has become a busy town largely because BDBD, with a population of over 280,000 refugees, according to previous statistics, being revised is only slightly above 10 kilometers away from this town. Upon arrival, as is the requirement, we are taken through a briefing session by Christopher Angualia, one of the settlement commandants in charge of Zone 1. So the partners right now we have around 59 partners and we group these 59 partners into eight sectors and each sector has a lead partner it means a sector like Helen there are many partners in Helen more than five six but there's one partner coordinating the activities of all those partners in Helen I'm going to clear for you this letter you'll use it for accessing the settlement our mission is to find the living conditions of the child-headed families and teenage mothers. About half an hour at the OPM, and with the help of a local guide, we head to village eight of zone one to meet two young mothers and both heads of their respective families. 18-year-old Winnie Gloria was living a normal life of a teenager with her mother in Juba until the war suddenly started. Coming back from school on the fateful day, only to find her mom was killed. Together with her brother, she had no choice but to leave the next morning. Five terrible days of walking until the worst possible thing she could have wished for happened. The brother, Gloria says, was slaughtered. Now that war, the war happening, I don't know about it. Kenya people, are, people are outside there, they came, they started to kill people. For us, we are inside. When that was happening, even me, I'm just, they yes, used me in school. Now, my mothers, I went to school, I reached at home, I went to kill my mother. Now, from there, I started also. We are inside my, with my brothers, the big brother of mine. We can find this next to more like this. There are some neighbors like this. They say, ah, you people, you have to not be here. You have to travel. There is the war. Now we don't know that we will start it up. And we started to join with those people, with my brothers. I reached here. We reached somewhere. We are coming more food. Five days, we are still on the way. There is the same. People came and got my brother. They slaughtered my brother. I remain alone. There is some neighbor who helped me. They bring me. We live here. They wrap me with my baby. No one is take care of me. Give him, give him back. They take me in America. Seventeen-year-old Eunice Jokudu is another child mother living in this same village. Despite all the horror, the utter worst was yet to come for Gloria. Raped by a man during a search for firewood in the bush and with a wound on her back. She became the obvious target for a rapist as her friends outpaced and left her alone. 
baby. God help me to take care of my baby. Nice that. My back started paining me. I'm moving the hospital. They got wound on my back. They took me a rua. When they took me a rua, even this baby is still on my stomach. I stayed there with my baby. The baby is in the stomach. I have back wound. I'm keeping the baby in the, in the hospital. The baby reached eight months in the stomach. Started to pain me in the document the hospital double press on the baby. For Jokodu, a travel late in the night to the water drawing point was all her tormentors needed to execute their plan. The withdrawal of help by an aid organization after accusations by a malicious neighbor virtually cut off all of Gloria's hopes of any help. Now people started to me. We are, we are staying IRC. IRC, they used to move here. They are taking away me. They came, they leave me. Up to now, I'm staying with my baby. She has since been reduced to the help of good Samaritans. Her food rations are sometimes stolen by the unscrupulous people. She narrates at one point going without food for up to five days, only preparing the little maize flour into porridge for her baby. Now my another brother, her, my grandmother, mm. child, they are just that was started, people are running different. Now also my grandmother, they run different. Also for us, we run different. Now my grandmother had me, I'm here. She sent her child, a big one, come and see me. That brother came, I used to stay in this house, carpet. Now she came and said, like this, I'm so far. She said, let me help you. She built for me this house. He's here, they're sleeping with my neighbor. Now, they want to build for me a house. Somebody say like this is went and told those people that eh, I have a big passion here. I have people they can support me. Now they started to cancel my name away. Despite the initial hardship that chased her to Uganda, given a chance, Gloria would willingly repatriate to South Sudan. I decided I want if I have money I want to go back. Eunice, meanwhile, has a different view on the same. I love my bar. I want to come for all. I want to go to that one. Go to see Swiss. Like I'm listening to my bar. Can see next year all of my friends. Gloria fondly remembers her mother's words of inspiration about education and how she wanted to become a doctor. But for me, in my future, I want to be also a doctor. But now, God doesn't want for us. These dreams have since faded because of lack of opportunities. All her focus is to adequately struggle to take care of her baby, whom she hopes can through God's help become a doctor like she had wanted. Sit on the market. I will go back to sit there. I will take care of my baby. I will let my baby be cool. I want to let her be in love. Now 10 months old by press time. Gloria named her baby Blessing Mokisa. And with a rare bitter smile, she explains how this name was given. That name, that name is the one who operated me. The name is the Mokisa. Told me that that is his blessing. She wants this baby's name to be Mokisa Blessing. But for Eunice, her dream of being a teacher is still alive. Mrs. Nelly William is a secretary for women affairs in Block 8 and an adolescent mentor. She describes the initial condition during arrival of the child-headed families and adolescent mothers as sad. 
it was sad you sometimes we even collapse we can only attend to two to three homes we first hide ourselves you pretend as if you are going to do something but you go and shed tears on a positive note though nelly says the situation of trauma for the child headed families is now reducing thanks to the counseling by the refugee leadership group comes in i see they have some group of gbv workers they also come they are now moving door to door uh, counseling people you don't see the appearance of a person but you should bring a word that will convince someone and then again also the tpo they, they also come whereby they are now they have a uh, child parenting spaces they are admitting also girls they talk to these people and they have the signs of people who have a problem they were also being trained about that Mr. Michael Kenyi is a caregiver at one of the early childhood facilities which are also used by the adolescent mothers and their child-headed families. Through games, debates and dramas, he's hoping that the recovery of this delicate group of young mothers and child-headed families will improve. When we bring them together in the center, like maybe if we have some topic of discussion after discussing that topic, we shall have maybe interbusy a competition center to center like maybe this is zone one we can at times organize these children we go to zone two and also share ideas from those ones in zone two and they compare of the lifestyle that they have here and those ones in zone two is it is it the, the same lifestyle that they're having or they're having some maybe variation in the lifestyle that they have interactions and observations here in this vast settlement point to the obvious improvements that have taken place since 2016 for instance Mrs. Joy Apai is now involved in stone quarrying for extra income. An activity through which she has avoided the over-reliance on donations. Ali Barak was born in Eritrea. He came to South Sudan and the war displaced him to Uganda. He is one of the people who are defying the odds to make it in life. My business, I'm starting here and from Uganda here. Now, let me say, I was taking like uh, two years. Now, when I'm starting my business, I'm starting with a small money. Now, like this, so now I have this, like something like a small, I'll make, I'll make my budgeting. Now, I have a lot of my customers. Whereas all such positive trends pointing to a better livelihood should bring a smile on the faces of those concerned about universal human well-being, it's only realistic not to get carried away because groups just like that of Eunice and Gloria still have a long way to go before the unseen wounds of the war come totally healed.